All right, let's get into the film list. Let's get into the film list. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Am I rushing you? Or are you rushing me? I don't know. I'm Puerto Rican. Dad joke? Terrible, right? Okay, Venom 2. Last month, I was supposed to have seen Venom 2. Um, let's say I didn't see it the way I wanted to. If you know what I mean. But I liked it. Venom does what Venom does. I think I'd like Venom to be more of an anti-hero, more of a slightly bad guy film. But Sony, almost in the same way that Netflix, they want to give you a character that you enjoy so that they can sell you a lot of products. So I get it. The post credit scene. Venom is now in the MCU, or now connects to the MCU, or maybe we have to wait to the Spider-Man Far From Home post credit scene to fully understand what it means. I am a huge Spider-Man fan, as you know. You know, amazing responsibility behind me. Right next to you, camera, is literally at least 20 Funko Pops that are all Spider-Man. It's still hard for me to wrap my mind around how they're trying to connect Venom to the MCU, so I don't know how a gradual viewer is going to do it. Maybe I'm thinking too much about it, maybe because I want them to do it right and because I want them to do it perfectly. And maybe just a casual viewer doesn't care. You know, you've given me space gods falling from the sky, I'll believe anything. But I'm really trying to cross my fingers that they don't. Mess this up. We're less than a month away from Far From Home. I'm going to love it regardless. We know that. Like, there's not a question about it. Will it hit all the spots that it needs to hit? I'm optimistic. I'm positive about it. I just think that what they're doing is extremely ambitious. And, and, and I don't know if it's necessary. I don't know if it's only being driven by greed. But I'm down for the ride because it's something that I never, ever, ever in a million years expected that I would get. Moving on from Venom 2, which is apparently in the map. I'm happy Venom is in the MCU. Don't get me wrong. I'm just like not extremely confident on what on how how they've how they've executed this. But I don't know anything yet. I'm speculating. Don't get hyped up before it happens. Just enjoy the ride. And I'm trying to. I'm trying to enjoy this the web swing. But it's hard to enjoy the web swing when I just found out that Spider-Man is Peter and it's all over the city. That's what Mary Jane is saying. Alright, I'm done. I'm done. My Mary Jane. <laughs> My Mary Jane was white. <laughs> don't start the hashtag. Please don't start the hashtag. My Mary Jane was white. My MJ was white. Uh, <laughs> so staying into the Marvel C MCU, we have Eternals. So sp last, this was what I was leading up with the foundation conversation. It's how you leave them, folks. It's how you end the show. And Eternals left me <sighs> upset. Not upset, because I didn't know what to expect. I just think it did so much, or it tried to do so much, but actually did so very little. Um, first hour was just all exposition, slow story building. Probably felt like literally the opposite of a Marvel film. It felt like a, oh, like a, like a, like a, like a, like a, like a Oscar nominated three hour film with no score it wasn't like this but like that's kind of how it led you on like this roller coaster and those films you know like a leonardo dicaprio film um there's a specific film that i have in mind with philip seymour hoffman that's not the the something with oh well i won't look for it right now but that's in my mind where it's like just a slow start and then it takes off almost like a tarantino film you know where it's like Giving you exposition, exposition, and then goes up. That's how it starts. 
but then it never blows up. But in the middle, there is a great action-packed, surprisingly complex and unexpected story that comes out of it. But it just does not end well. It what it didn't end on a cliffhanger. Cliffhanger. It ended just lack on a lackluster ending. That made me not really understand what why it ended that way, and therefore, and also not that interested in what you can come back with. I feel like they kept telling us like, "Hey, we're in the MCU. We're in the MCU. We're in the MCU," but did nothing to connect to the rest of the movies. And maybe that's the issue. Maybe, maybe this is proof that you can't exactly make a standalone movie into the, in the MCU in the MCU anymore. It has to build to the bigger story. Now I have seen, and I'll give shout outs to Ryan Airy from Screen Crush, give this beautiful twelve or thirteen minute video essay on what. The Eternals all met, and the way that he was able to look at it, he was actually able to like, create a direct line and show that it's the retelling of the Bible in the MCU. And when you connect the dots in that way, it's a beautiful story. Maybe if I go back after watching it in that context, I will be able to see it with completely new light, even down to the ending. But if I gotta do all that, the f I shouldn't have to do all that. I don't shouldn't have to go do research after I watch your movie there and be able to enjoy it. Christopher Nolan, Tenet. The fuck? Movie guys. <laughs> it's an army of thieves. Oh, we've already crossed an hour. We're gonna keep going. This is the overconsumption episode. Let's overconsume a little bit. You see my half glitch? 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 So, Army of Thieves. If you don't know, Army of the Dead came out earlier this year. Zack Snyder. I really, really loved it. Like, too much. Almost. I love the world that he built. I'm, I wouldn't... I really like Zack Snyder, actually. I don't, oh, well, I'm not crazy what he did. I'm actually, I don't like what, so much what he did. Or maybe I just, I don't like what came out of his work with the, uh, with DC. Um, you know, I'm, a, I, I was happy to get the Zack Snyder Justice League cut. It is extremely, so much better than the original, but I hated the original. So, you know, even being like a, going up to like a four from a zero is, is still a huge step up. I'm not saying Justice League of the Four. I'm just saying very low bar, very low expectations of making it better. And I do think it did a good job, but I still don't love it. But I loved Army of the Dead. And the cool thing is that that Netflix and I shit on Netflix a bit this episode, so it's good to be able to also give them their props and their kudos. The cool thing is that for the first time, studios are being able to like fully capitalize in the dreams of their creators. You know what I mean? Like, oh, all right, this is a good example of it. That couldn't be proven better than when Disney did. It just happened. You know, it gave us. A fanboy's orgasm, like a fanboy's live stream, live orgasm. I remember the rumors of Moon Knight being a show, like thinking, uh, it was, I think at the time it was going to be a CW show. And like, if you've ever watched anything that I've done, then you've probably heard me talk about how much I dislike CW shows and the idea of having to get through 23 episodes of a show to tell me a story because really all you're doing is pushing product to put your commercials. But now I'm getting a a, 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 a I Oscar Isaac, a damn one of the finest movie stars that is taking place right now and a series that is going to feel like a Hollywood film. 
on a weekly basis. I can't help you with that on Mac. I just woke up, Siri. Thank you for being here. Well, that's what Army of Thieves <laughs> says. I just put Moon Knight over to give Army of Thieves praise. But really, it's like, it really, I mean, Army of Thieves wasn't so necessary. Uh, the lead actor, I can't, I, I can't remember his name. And if I, if I did remember his name, I, I know that it's a hard enough name that I may not be able to say it correctly anyway. So I don't even want to butcher it. But the, 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 the main actor, the, 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 the main actor is incredible at that role. Like, I'm not shitting on it, but I'm just saying like he was really able to create a character within that role. And I appreciate him for it. I like him for it. Somehow they got the girl from Game of Thrones and Fast and Furious. Oh, what is her name? Uh, Natalie Emmanuel? I hope that's right. Um, somehow they took her character from Fast and Furious and was like, hey, let's put it in the Zack Snyder film. Because uh, it's like, okay, you just do everything. You're this, you're that, you're that. You're a spy, you're a thief, you're that. You're a robbery. You're... All right, okay, Vin Diesel. Um, but I think that the biggest thing that say out of this is very cool to be able to create a, a film. And before we even know if the film was going to do well or not, they gave the director the ability to do more with that story, to build into that world. There was also a lot more zombies in Army of Thieves than I ever thought there was going to be. And I enjoy that. It, it made sense. You do you like how I I, I I do all this? I do an hour plus of content and I don't give no spoilers. I just tell you what it made me feel like. You like that? Do I get props for that? Huh? Does I? Does I get props? Props? For that? Do I get props for that? All right, let's move on. The harder they fall. The harder they fall. I mean, the, what was the big first thing you heard about it? Oh, Jay-Z and Kid Cudi are doing a song, their first song ever for it. That's not true. Jay-Z and Kid Cudi have a song on Blueprint 3 together. Like, that was Kid Cudi's first job after... He got hired from Good Music. It was like, go work on 808s and Heartbreaks and go work on Blue for 3. Do your research, people. I think I've read that as an article. That I think that's why that sticks to me. Um, but, you know, what can I say about The Heart of the Fall? I love a good Western film. I love a, a strong Western film, right? Like I talked about Cowboy Bebop earlier. The part of the reason that Cowboy Bebop is so cool is that it's a great space Western. I love a black film with an all-black cast. Not in a pandering way, because I think you can pander to that too, but in a way that makes sense and that shows the realities of people's lives. Especially, right, like, like I, I don't know. I don't know if the, if the percentage is like six, all 60% of cowboys were black men. You don't see that on television. Idris Elba is great. Regina King is great. Jonathan Majors is great. Dion Cole is great. Zazie Beats is great. Zazie, Zazie Beats. Oh, she's she's great. She's great, great. Uh, which Wayne's son is in it? He's great. Yeah, it's just great. And like, I enjoy that I can watch an all-black film with an all-black cast that's a Western film and just be like, yo, that was great, it was unique, it was interesting, cool. Move on. Because, not that it's becoming the norm, but we are living in a world that it's possible. And that's the world I want to live in. You know, I didn't have to go into a niche movie theater to, to go watch this. It was on Netflix. And that is when our, when our stars, right, when our icons, when our Jay-Zs, like, I think that is what 
their position. That is what they should be doing with their with their power. They should be giving opportunities and changing the perspective of the future, because that's what you do with that voice. And I think it's important to to highlight it, but it's also incredible that we don't have to highlight it too. And the last film that we're going to talk about, because I still haven't finished Finch. I'm only an hour into it. I really liked it. I just paused it because I had something to do that night. And because of my overconsumption, I haven't gotten back to it. So when I get back to it, I'm probably going to watch the whole thing all over again. So the only other film that we really have to talk about tonight is Red Notice. Starring The Rock, Ryan Reynolds, Gal Gadot, Fast and the Furious recap. All right, all right. The Fast and the Furious reunion, they're all back together. Um, right, Ryan Reynolds was in Hobbs and Shaw. Um, Wonder Woman, Black Adam, Deadpool in a movie together, like... Great movie stars. Ryan Reynolds has an amazing career because he was able to literally put himself into every single role. And that's like, who who is his agent? How how is he able, who writes his scripts? Does he write? Uh, I don't know. Amazing. Uh, the Rock was going around in interviews telling everybody that he knew he had to do the movie when he read the twist in it. So I went into the movie expecting for there to be a twist. And now I think, don't do that, Rock. I know you think it's cool to do that because you're like, you want to bring as many people in to watch the movie and it's a film, it's not real life. So whatever you can tell them to get them to come in. But I think don't do that because I think... Even though I expected it almost in the same way I did with True Story, where I'm like, all right, some, there's something going on here. My brain is trying to figure out the whole time. Uh, there also, when you tell me there's a twist, my brain is waiting for the twist the whole time, too. And I think that does take you out of the film a little bit. But it's great. Uh, I don't talk about wrestling too much on this show, because if you want to hear my thoughts and you want to get into my passion about wrestling than you would be watching because the silent piece said so on the cool company youtube channel or podcast channel but i will say something that the average viewer person who watched red notice won't notice is won't know is that uh wwe the rocks old you know place of employment did a wrestling show called Survivor Series which The Rock also premiered on 25 years ago and did a branded integration and nobody really cared about Survivor Series anyway but it was absolutely horrible and it was a 3 hour or 4 hour commercial for Red Notice and it made a lot of people never want to watch WWE ever again but it made them a lot of money and it will allow WWE to continue to do things like that so Red Notice was enjoyable but I think it added some negativi negativity and evil into the world now three specials we're almost at an hour and 15 minutes I want to, I think we can get, we can, we've stuffed ourselves, we've eaten a lot, but I think we can get done with this by an hour and 20 minutes. So no transition, no break for specials. Let's just dive right into specials. So there are three specials that we're going to dive into that I think, not that I think, that had a major impact on me. Each of them very differently. <clears throat> I had... Let's call it a manic night. That can mean a lot of different things. I'll let you figure out what it means. But I had a manic night. This is not the same night I stayed up to 5 a.m. This is another night where I was up to probably 7, 8, 7, 8 a.m. And 
after the true journey of my night, I decided to watch something that I, that I knew was going to connect with me very deeply. And that was A Man Named Scott. The Kid Cudi film that has basically, you know, basically documented and basically went into a deep dive into the last 10 or 12 years of Cuddy's career. And I think the most important thing I can say about that is just to talk about how greatly Cuddy has had an impact on me. I remember working at American Apparel, that first Man on the Moon album came out and I we played it nonstop. We played it constantly. We didn't care who thought anything about it because it was an album for a generation almost immediately. Uh, my Before this even happened, my graduation day, Kid Cudi did a free concert in South Street Seaport. We were out there. There was maybe 30, 40 of us. It wasn't even that crowded. I think it might have rained a little bit. And Kid Cudi performed for us. He asked us in the crowd, like, what song y'all want to hear? And when we said it, he played it. And at that moment, I wasn't the hugest Kid Cudi fan, but I respected him so much for that moment. And to watch this movie, to watch this documentary, I don't care about how good it was cinematically because obviously Kid Cudi had a play in producing it and creating it. And it it seemed like it was important for him. And as somebody who has been so greatly affected by what he has done, I'm happy for him for to be able to have something like that for himself. And therefore, for us too. Moving on to another special, Michael Che, Shame the Devil. I've seen Michael Che specials before. I don't know if I saw his last one. I don't think it would... Well, he said he hasn't done one in five years. So, I don't know. Maybe he did another project. I feel like there's a Michael J. project that I didn't see. And in in somewhat in his discography. Um, but I watching Michael J. for the first time in five years. Let's say I, and I, let's say I don't really remember his, his pieces that greatly from before. It's great to see somebody be like, yo, I make smart comedy. And yeah, motherfucker, this shit is smart. If you're not smart, fuck off. Because, you know, Dave Chappelle talks about, like, I make real comedy. If you don't like real comedy, fuck off, right? Like, that's what everybody talks about. And I think people could crap on Michael Che because, like, he does Saturday Night Live. And they could say that maybe he is working for a certain audience, right? Because that's what people say when you don't connect where they want you to connect or you don't perform where they want you to perform but I think he has been able to really take that all in and be like fuck off this is the shit I make if you don't like it if you don't understand it then it's not for you but I can definitely say that there are people who do like it and I think that's really cool to be able to say that and I did enjoy his piece. Literally, from beginning to end. Last piece. Uh, wow, this is another like 3 a.m. piece. Have I not been sleeping? Have I not been sleeping in the last month? Is that what this is coming down to? Um, I met Billie Eilish. Through another special, through another piece. But Billie Eilish, I don't know, somehow we end up meeting at like 3 a.m. all the time. Which is probably strange because I'm a 30 year old man and she is not as old as me. So why am I, why is Billie Eilish the home that I'm searching for at 3 o'clock in the morning? I don't know. Genuinely, no clue why. But thank you for being here when I need you anyway, Billie. No, but so a few weeks ago, like, I don't know, it was early in the morning. You know what it is? And I, I, I could speak about it. Billie Eilish is truly living like a 2021 pop star life. That's cool. And, I, you know, I admire that. I think that there are very few people who actually become pop stars in the world, right? And they 
get to live out dreams and aspirations that most people will never ever be able to touch. They're, they get, li get to live out dreams and aspirations that they never expected to be able to do. So it's really cool to be able to watch in real time. Um, a few weeks ago, there was a, there's an Apple TV uh, Billy Eilish special that's like two and a half hours long. And I watched maybe the first hour, maybe the first 45 minutes of it. And I just enjoyed watching it. Uh, now, I knew there was a Disney Plus one that I was going to, uh, that I wanted to get to. So I decided to put that on at 3 a.m. And what it was, was a live concert experience that was like mixed in with a Disney cartoon. And then I saw that it was like directed by Robert Rodriguez. And I'm like, yo, what a cool moment for a, uh, oh, and then it was featuring the choir that she grew up being a choir, like a, a singer in. Just what a cool moment in Los Angeles inside of an empty Orpheum theater. And then she played the album from beginning to end, so it's such the first time I've ever listened to a Billie Eilish album. Cool. I really like pop music. When it's done right, and when it means something, because it is literally a popular cultural experience that so little people actually get to live. And it's a cool thing to experience and to exhibit. Now, we passed the hour and 20 minute mark, but that's fine. We won't take any more breaks. We'll just end this episode speaking about music. I can't remember if I've spoken about H.D. Ben Dope on this show before, but H.D. Ben Dope is a young Brooklyn artist. He's probably 20 years old. Um, one day a week, because I'm an old man, I try to like put on MTV and try to put it on in the background because... I don't know, part of me thinks it's important to just stay connected with everything that's going on, you know, bring it back to that level of over-consuming to stay satisfied. Uh, but H.C. Ben Dope, I've been following him, like, he's kind of small, right, like 17,000 followers, but he's a really great rapper, um... He speak. He's has an interesting perspective, um, and I like I like his his visuals. That's really what captured me at first. So he just dropped out a new album, and it's great. Like that, I'm listening to like these eighteen and twenty year olds. You know, Baby Keem and H. D. Ben Dope. Part of my regular listening habit and part of my regular stream. You know, it's weird being inspired by younger kids and being inspired by the peers that's a weird thing as an adult but i enjoy it and i'm a big fan of it other than that h deep and dope and earl on a beat project it's called side a the the, pref the preface ep uh there's a song by this guy named buju who is i believe a west african artist it's called never stop and it is a banger 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 his whole album is good but officially Never Stop has kind of made it into my regular stream and my mainstream thing of things. And the last music piece and the last real piece of content we're going to talk about today's episode is Big Sean and Hit Boy's album, which I was able to listen to once. I was a very huge Big Sean fan. I've seen Big Sean at Warped Tour um, around the time of the, what is that, Finally Famous 2 or Finally Famous 3 album. Um... You know, he's going, as he's gotten bigger, uh, we maybe have fell in off, fallen off. I maybe listened to the first Detroit album. I did miss a few albums in between there. I think he has a perspective that people sleep on him. I think maybe people do sleep on him. I think he became a pop star when he was like, had the champagne. Early in the morning, early in the night, champagne, and got that gone. And that's on a na na na. I can't remember how that song goes. Um, but I think he became a pop star really quickly. And that is not always so cool because people don't expect you to be a pop star forever. So if you don't keep it up, um, they don't want anything to do with you. I will say, I'm a big fan of Hit Boy. And even though I like Big Sean and Fallen Off, the album's good. It just doesn't sound right. Like, it don't bang. It don't hit. It feels like it's not mixed right. And I feel like that's a problem with 
a lot of Big Sean's albums that the production just doesn't sound as good as it should be. And that is very unfortunate because it's almost you can't get past it. It, it almost make, uh, makes a lot of the listens unmemorable and unfocused. 